Namaskar and welcome to IIPA. In this program, Stalwart Speak, as you know, we have been talking to very senior and bright minds. We try to gain perspectives and insights from them which are contemporary and relevant. And today also we have a very senior guest here. He is the former Defence Secretary, Mr. Ajay Kumar. We are going to talk to him about the entire perspective that is around our defence mechanism in the country and how India is getting more secured. So welcome to the show, sir, first of all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and as we are sitting today, I think from your perspective would be to tell us as to how is India is looking at its security. Jo kehte hai ki hum sote rehte hai, lekin wo jaagte hai jo humari raksha karte hai. So tell us about the whole security aspect, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to say that we have one of the most committed and devoted set of armed forces who have always stood up to face all the challenges that have come, notwithstanding the constraints that either our geography puts or our neighborhood may put. Second is the effort of the government has been to equip the armed forces with the best uh, equipment and make sure that they are modern and ready to face any challenges. And this has been a process which has particularly got an impetus under the At Nirbharta in defense campaign. And as a result of this, we are now seeing that our armed forces today are getting new arms which are designed and developed in India. The biggest advantage of this is when you import from someone, the problem is first, you are in this global armament trade, the person who is selling you can also sell the same thing to your adversary. Second is, no one really gives you the latest technology. They always give you N minus 1 technology. So when you are importing, you are likely to get the second best. And the most important thing is you are dependent on him for spares and servicing. Hmm. So really speaking, you are constrained by his outlook because he can kind of, uh, you know, make your equipment unavailable. So that's where my second question would be. Then how are we looking at making ourselves independent there? You talked about the spare part and those mechanisms which make us actually art nirbhar. Yeah. So, so it's very important, therefore, that if we want to be, have our own uh, you know, independent uh, policy, we should be truly self-reliant. And this, we, you know, the government has taken several steps, which have, for the first time, brought in true self-reliance. True self-reliance can come not because we are only manufacturing the equipment in India, but when the technology is ours. Hmm. Till now, we had several, uh, you know, uh, units which were producing uh, arms in India, but they were all based on transfer of technology from foreign OEMs. Hmm. But when you take transfer of technology, you will find that the foreign OEM will put constraints on you. He will put constraints in terms of number of items you can produce. Hmm. He can produce, he will put constraints on how you can use those items hmm. and he will put constraints on whether you can export it or not. So if you want to give it to a friendly country, you cannot give it without his permission. We have, in, under the uh, Atmir Bharata campaign, focused on developing our own technology. And under the IDEX program, hmm. our startups have done wonderfully well. Okay. They have, you know, large number of startups in a diversified domains are today producing technology at a scale which is several times faster than the traditional rate at which new technologies are being produced in India. And sir, nobody had earlier thought of having startups in defense sector, <laughs> and, as crucial as that. And at a cost which is a fraction, and when I say fraction, at sometimes one-fifth or one-tenth of the cost at which we would spend. In fact, under IDEX, the assistance, maximum assistance that is given is one and a half crore. Whereas in defense R&D projects, we often give hundreds and thousands of crores for each project. And today, you know, startups are making the difference. 
The second thing is government has also done is that they have earmarked a big part of the budget hmm. for only buying equipment from India. Hmm. And as a result, this this process was started in 2020-21. It was 58 percent of the budget was earmarked. Next year it was 64 percent. Subsequent hmm. it was 68 percent, and this year it is 75 percent. Okay, okay. So, so which means we point. have, and this remaining part is mostly to cater to the earlier import commitments. Hmm. In recent years, no, we are making sure that most of the things are being bought from India. Hmm. which is creating this huge impetus. Third is, you see, the positive indigenization list, hmm. which is a statement clearly giving indication to the industry hmm. that these items henceforth will be bought from India. So they can prepare, they can invest, they can develop those items in India. And then they can be, because these will henceforth not be imported. So clear mandate to them to develop it in India. Fourth is, we are also looking at increasingly engaging with our academia. Hmm. Apart and uh, academia along with the industry together for so synergy for synergy and for creating new technologies and lastly i want to say that we have seen that in new and emerging technologies india has lot of strengths for example in digital technologies exactly and in defense the, there is a huge uh, you know as in uh, all other sectors technologies are becoming more and more electronified if i may use that word or digitalized. Mm -hmm. No, Artificial I would ask it differently, sir. So yes. digital technology, yes, a need and communication techniques, because we are saying that in the new age battle would be about how we handle absolutely, communication. Absolutely. And it's absolutely, you're absolutely right. And you see, uh, the new age warfare is all about uh, communication. And therefore, we are today, you know, we, you know, as you know, we have now been developing the 5G uh, stack in India and mm. we are one of the few countries who are going to have our own 5G stack. 50-60% of stack has been developed. Today we are in this new emerging technologies we find we have significant strengths and we are today better than the best. I will give you one example. In quantum computing, mm. one of our uh, startups by the name QNU, mm. they have been able to develop quantum jump of 150 kilometers over fiber, where the best in the world is 90 kilometers. What it effectively means is that if you have to do quantum communication over a distance of, let us say, uh, 500 kilometers, you will need only three hops here, where you need five hops, so your technology is nearly six, one, you know, 40 percent cheaper. Sure. We just and had National is, Quantum Mission launch. And also. now the National Quantum Mission has I been mean, mm, launched. So, so the point I'm saying is we are finding that in new technologies, our, our industry, our startups, mm, uh, mm. our academy are doing extremely well. We are, we are also working is on the traditional things like engines, okay. materials, where I think over the years we have had dependence. Mm. And I think slowly we need to work on these areas so that in coming years we can also become so in these directions. Another, another area of convergence, sir, is uh, how we look at space sector. For example, the geospatial policy 2022 is also looking at mapping uh, the entire sector by 2030, if I'm not wrong. So how uh, science, innovation, the sector that we're now looking at, space sector, is also somewhere aligning with our needs there in defense sector. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, space is the new dimension of warfare, you know. Today, space is both from economic perspective as well as a new frontier of, uh, uh, you know, man's development, mm. as well as from a warfare perspective becoming extremely important. And uh, Drone technology, for example. Drone technology is becoming extremely important. Drone, you have seen how, you know, defense has led the explosion of drone capabilities and I said new technologies mm. uh, including drones we are doing exceedingly well we have at least 100 different small and big companies who are into drone and most of these drones all the three services are today buying are from in indigenous drones designed developed in India I cannot tell you how beneficial it is for the forces when you buy from a company in India mm. because the costs are lower mm. your servicing is easier Hmm. And the time taken for servicing becomes that much smaller. Earlier, for many platforms, the downtime used to be nearly 50 to 60 percent. That means if a platform, if you have 100 items, 
50 percent of the items would be under maintenance because they had to go to a foreign country or spare has to be brought from a foreign country. It would take time for that to come and get repaired. When you have an indigenous company doing this, you can actually do this in a matter of weeks and your downtime comes to 90, 90 I mean your hmm. uptime comes to 90, 95 percent. So it's a huge advantage when you have drones like this. But coming back to the point of space, so in October uh, uh, 2022 in DEF Expo, Honorable Prime Minister launched 75 challenges uh, for space. As mm. you know, in 2020, the space sector was opened up. Mm. And today, space is something which, you know, industries, startups, all exactly. can participate. And some of our startups like Agnikul and all are doing exceedingly Skyroot well. Skyroot also. Yeah. Skyroot, Agnikul. So, we have now made specific requirements of defense available to our startups. And I am sure that in the coming 24 to 36 months, we will start seeing our startups meeting, you know, uh, creating uh, satellite launches, creating payloads which will go on to the satellites, creating analytics of all the data that comes through these satellites, all in it, creating actual sensors that are required, which will be used to enhance our space needs of armed forces. And all this has happened now in terms of earlier we thought that space was a very closed kind of sector. Nobody really, it was very hush-hush. Now everything is not only opening up but creating new horizons. Sir. And that's what you're explaining absolutely, here for absolutely. all of us. Uh, talking about creating another coverage for our country. And that's where I would say, how are we looking at some of the neighbors? I mean, uh, this whole idea of, again, in the new modern era, how are we looking at A, the world order and how India's interests are uh, protected uh, you know in the if you look at india <clears throat> india's been never has been an aggressor against any country mm. we have never viewed on the territory of another country at the same time we are very clear that if any country ties to look at us with aggression, hmm. we will respond accordingly. And if you look at Galwan, hmm. this is a clear incident when the armed forces for the first time were face to face with China after four decades. And they were, uh, you know, they stood their ground and actually tactically made Chinese beat a retreat. Hmm. The important point is that whether it was militarily or whether it was economically or whether it was tactically, it was clear that India of today is not going to be pressurized to protect its sovereignty and territorial integrity. That is the first point. Second point is today, you see, if you look at it, Military aggression is one part, hmm. but we see aggression in many other forms. Exactly, sir. You see people doing, you know, I mean, cyber hmm. is one is thing one which thing. we are quite aware of. And we need to make sure that we create a coverage hmm. from the cyber aspect, protect the countries, uh, the critical infrastructure. Uh, so infrastructure which is non-military but could affect large scale loss to uh, you know civilian uh, property or uh, civilian activity we have to there is a lot of information warfare that exactly. is going on where you know people are actually through uh, propaganda using all kind of communication medium that exists today from social media to other media you can actually create a narrative which may be totally false exactly. and you uh, you know that's and challenge. that is often done because what you know countries try to do is they want to exploit fault lines that may exist in a society in a very normal way mm. but through a suitably targeted propaganda you can actually accentuate these differences create and fissures, create and, get fissures into... and you know mm. create uh, differences uh, which are you know further uh, you know uh, make this more aggravate uh, the whole aggravate situation. the whole thing you see economic warfare where today we have seen countries who are using creation of dual use infrastructure 
which will be used you know which is ostensibly for you know economic purposes but it has a military content behind it you create a port which looks like a simple uh, you know commercial port but it has also capability to meet military requirements you you, you see uh, energy warfare mm. where today as you have seen during the, you know the russia ukraine mm. war mm. energy has become such a potent mm. uh, you see food warfare because mm. food security is so important and food availability through food supply chains get affected mm. and people are affected so I, the point i'm saying there are multiple ways that today this warfare is happening and in our geopolitical situation in the uh, geopolitics of our neighborhood mm. as mm. we see i think we have today been in the act east policy of india has enabled us to you know for example with bangladesh mm. we have seen tremendous progress of our relationship and our as a result of which both bangladesh and northeast india has benefited our uh, with myanmar mm. you know despite there being a, a you know government military government and constraints that put because uh, you know indian overall support for democracy to be followed we have been able to maintain very good relationship and ensure that developmental work of myanmar has not been affected in sri lanka where we had actually seen that uh, there was large scale debt hmm. which they had taken from chinese uh, uh, today when the situation became bad in sri lanka india was the country mm. which came to their uh, help and sri lanka is ex- very grateful and uh, you know uh, recognizes that india is the country which will come to our help with maldives we have an exceedingly good relationship and we have a friendly government in afghanistan and- our policy has been continuously today people of afghanistan are if you ask them they are the most Uh, you know, uh, they find India as one country who has alwe- mm. always helped in their needs. All our projects have been to meet the needs, and we have consistently and steadily continued this, irrespective of the changes of regime that have gone in Afghanistan. Mm. So you see, in mo- most of our neighbor, in Nepal, Bhutan, also we have consistently maintained all. Uh, you know, despite the political changes that have taken place in nepal over the last few years we have consistently maintained our support and uh, and bhutan of course is a, a very and good friend and one neighbor that of course we all will uh, would But, like to uh, uh, our stand is very clear we are looking at peace see look at their situation they themselves are facing the consequences of the policies they have adopted and i don't have to speak more mm. yes sir so uh, uh, and we are now uh, uh, heading g20 india is the president now and uh, so a lot of responsibilities also but lot of growth happening because of this mutual ideas being shared sir so uh, how would you really look at some of these uh, shared uh, interests that india yeah so you know i mean i think uh, g20 is an old forum it's not a mm-hmm. new forum mm-hmm. and g20 always tries to bring together uh, countries which can lead the world in terms of further growth of human mankind one big difference is in this this time is that today one because of india's position india is today able to bring together uh, forces which are today very antagonistic i mean you see russia ukraine uh, us china and all that but india is one country which has capability of bringing these countries together on a table to discuss mm. issues and sort out the second and even more important thing is today our, you know you look at what happened in covid India was able to support 180 countries at times when the whole uh, medical supply chains were getting affected in the world in IT and digital India today the experiments the way we have ramped up the way we have grown whether it is aadhar whether it is upi and the way even other not so talked about digital applications no other country in the world has seen such rapid adoption of technology in a period of you know 6 7 years 8 years we have seen you know 
from practically zero. If I were to talk of UPI, UPI was launched in 2015 and 2015, and now we are seeing the world's fifth, more than 50 percent of our strides actually. Sir. actually. So as yeah, far as so the speed, the world. So there is a lot that we can offer. The point I wanted to make is, all this shows that there is lot that we have to offer, and you know. Uh, the world is looking at several of these examples, which was never the case before. See, collaboration and networking was always a part of G20 meetings. But for the first time, there are things that we can showcase. I mentioned about quantum computing. Mm. There are new technologies in different fields where our uh, what we have done could very well. Today, drones, for example, we are doing Smavitva, mm. which is countrywide survey of villages Again, through, so drones. through drones, because yeah. it's not possible to do this manually, I and mean, we can say that we want to do Maybe it. Maybe a breakthrough ages. scheme, at least, for Mitra, But yes. look at there's a whole lot of developing world which needs this, which has never been able to complete a survey anywhere in the world, and this is a model that can be used by the rest of the world as well. So there are several such examples which the world is today looking on us. Sure, sir. Yeah. And uh, as far as internally, how we are becoming stronger? So, in terms of the reform processes that should happen, you have looked at things. So, how are we, uh, in terms of our, whether it's about equipment, weaponry, whether it's about the personnel, whether it's looking at infrastructure, logistics, as we are uh, looking at making ourselves internally stronger, how would you really look at those so, you know, steps? You know, one of the, you know, I think I was extremely lucky to have been in. Uh, defense ministry as defense secretary during a period of large number of reforms, possibly the first ever such large scale reforms that has ha that have, that have happened in independent India, and of course, the most important thing, something which should have been done several decades back, the Cargill Review Committee mm -hmm. after the Cargill Wall recommended this that we should have a chief of defense staff who will bring in jointness among the three services, a and. No one has disagreed with this recommendation for uh, you know years after year after years because world has today f follows the, this model of jointness to so make sure the, each force is a very powerful instrument, but they have to work in cohesion. You know, duplication has to be avoided, hmm. and if you can actually bring them in cohesion, the effect it acts as a force multiplier, and we got CDS as you hmm. know very well in 2020. We wanted to make sure that there is better civil military integration uh, in the defense forces and this is another very important topic and for the first time department of military affairs was created hmm. with cds as the uh, secretary of hmm. department, department of military hmm. affairs one of the things which has <clears throat> been uh, you know a issue with our forces has been we have inherited a legacy of uh, you know, higher average age of our soldier. Mm. The average age in India of our army was five to six years more than most of the leading armies in the world, whether you compare it with Ch uh, China, US, UK. And we brought in Agnivir, mm. which will not only make sure that you get younger people, but also uh, you know, and remember, if you bring younger people, they are more technically savvy mm. naturally because they are all you know. Today's kids are all you know on technology. Tech savvy, yeah. But also provide, and that's a very important part of the reform. I must mention, also provide disciplined, trained, uh, morally and uh, you know ethically uh, skilled or trained people to the society because Agnivir. For every one person who is retained by the force, three people will go back at age of 21 in the society and serve the society in some other career. Mm -hmm. But remember, with their four years of training in the armed forces, they will be responsible, patriotic citizens of the country, something which our youth needs tremendously. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me, it will have a lot of impact on some of the social evils that we find today. We find, you know, uh, youngsters uh, misbehaving with women. We find corruption. I mean, a person trained uh, with armed forces for four years uh, uh, is undoubtedly going to be a significantly better citizen for the country and a whole pool of such trained, equipped, skilled mm -hmm. such So, we can say that we have looked at a new HR policy 
which looks at, at optimization of resource at its best. Absolutely. And then we are looking at modernization of armed forces. We brought in technology in a very big way. Somehow there was, you know, till about uh, 2019 or so, there was some apprehension that if we use digital technologies, because defense is sensitive, mm. then there is, uh, you know, fear of, uh, you know, leakage of data. But you must realize that today's world just, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, do without technology. And world over, all the armies in the world are using it. So the role of defense forces, especially army, I would say, and looking at internally, especially two crucial regions like Jammu and Kashmir and northeastern region, uh, you know, the talking about armed forces special power act. I mean, the way that it has kind of shrunk in terms of its overall volume, we would we are also looking at finally we are looking at an ecosystem which is built out of peace, more softening of uh, you know things between the let's say the citizen and the the force. How would you really look at that or your insights, views there? Sir? So, you know, I mean, uh, you look at, uh, you know, I have been, you know, in my, when I was deputy secretary, I used to look after Northeast, which is in middle of 90s. And in, uh, you know, 2020 or there about 2019 onwards, I was defense secretary. I have seen huge change between 20, 20 I mean, mid of 90s and 2020, in this 25 years, how no Northeast has progressed. Earlier, if there were 100 incidents, today we don't even have five incidents in Northeast. And therefore, the development process is truly set up. If you go to Assam of then and Assam of today, they are two different places. If you go to Mizoram of then and Mizoram of today, they are two different places. If you go to Nagaland and Manipur, which were, you know, hotbed of insurgent activity today, they are two different places. So I think we are moving in the right direction. Things have progressed a lot today. I mean, as you know, integration of Northeast is a priority from the government perspective. Mm. And this development will be the solution. The solution is never going to come from force. Solution is come from development. And the amount of infrastructure that is being developed in mm. Northeast, the amount of educational facilities that are being developed, and the emotional and cultural integration of Northeast with the rest of the country, which is happening in a very significant way today. I mean, I think we have champions, which we, the whole of country loves from the Northeast, you know, sports champions, other. So I think this is where you will find slowly, slowly, armies will, army will continue to go back into its barracks as we go. Uh, so forward. one question, which I think is very relevant on everyone would like to know also from you, uh, is that in the in the new scenario again in the post uh, not post actually the Ukraine Russia conflict, how how India has really looked at in terms of our learning our preparedness and all that. So first of all, I must say that you see, <clears throat> in Russia Ukraine war started, we have stood on principled ground. Our first priority at that time was to make sure that all the Indians who were in uh, Ukraine were safely, uh, you know, brought back. And, you know, we can be proud of the fact that this was one of the largest operations of its kind. And while large number of people from different nationalities were there, even people from our, uh, you know, from Pakistan and other countries were envious the way we, our, res you know, rescue operations for citizens of India in Ukraine took place. Second is... Because we, you know, we have good relationship with both Ukraine and Russia. But on humanitarian considerations, we supported uh, the people of Ukraine and made sure that aid was received both for in Ukraine and in the various countries in the neighborhood where the Ukrainian refugees were migrating to. So we have been able to support. At the same time, we think that the process of the war between Russia and Ukraine should be uh, a solution should be found through dialogue and we have maintained that stance We've always shown the generosity to support other countries with whatever surplus we had as we did in COVID even if you remember mm. COVID even when we did not have enough we were willing to support other countries and on energy security we have maintained our independence despite the pressure that we have faced from the western countries that our, we will buy our oil from the country which offers us best oil at best prices, as is the case which all other countries do. So, and that stand again shows, like I mentioned to you, today, you know, India is not going to be pushed over by 
any big country to follow their mm. uh, you know bidding we do uh, the country follows what is in its best interest and the best interests of a people mm. yeah, as regards we... as regards you asked about preparedness of uh, you know armed forces look several uh, lessons have come out of the ukraine war i mean we have seen that uh, modern type of warfare mm. is more relevant we've mm. seen use of information mm. warfare we use inf cyber warfare we've seen mm. drones we have seen uh, missiles at the same time we have also seen traditional warfare so we have seen hybrid warfare happening mm. second we have also seen that it is exceed so each of this has a huge role you see the way the information warfare has played in terms of morale of the forces mm. has you know it's a game which both sides have played to the best of their ability but one side has been able to create an impression of uh, you know greater which has gained greater sympathy than the other so these are becoming exceedingly important so all what we talked about these new forms of warfare are all in witness in russian ukraine war and uh, i think future wars we will always see this kind of a hybrid mix of the conventional war with all the new elements that will happen you know we have also seen our leadership actually also looking a lot at uh, you know uh, creating that very enabling ecosystem for example inclusion also so we're looking at let's say women also getting more entry how would you really like yeah, that's one of the reform things that we have done also so so i said there's a, several reforms and i i i don't think i have done uh, spoken about all of them but one of the important things is that we the in, introduction of women in all segments of armed forces which is happening and i think that's an extremely welcome step the women are very happy armed forces are today preparing to ref, you know create necessary infrastructure and social environment within their forces because it it will, it will be some change for them mm. but i think in the long run it will bring in greater sense of inclusivity and more uh, you know uh, in several aspects lot more capability within the forces by getting women into these different areas so but air force was one area possibly you know that uh, several of our women are actually very good pilots uh, you know fighter pilots and uh, they, they have been there in a big way uh, so thank you so much for sharing all these things we'll keep looking at some more ideas and perspectives from you but thank you so much for giving us all those very very specific inputs where we stand as a as a country and uh, how we are looking at really modernizing ourselves we are looking at strengthening ourselves internally uh, and dealing with external forces as well thank you so much sir thank you thank you for watching the show namaskar